So on the no, that's a great song, uh, Give You Praise. Uh, I, Friday morning I got to run, yay. Um, and on the run it was cold, so I got to wear my tights, which uh, Eric... That's all I'm saying. So er- Eric doesn't run with me on those days. Um, but I was all excited about going to the ocean, to the Atlantic, because I knew it was going to be a gorgeous sunrise, because it's cold, and it's always a beautiful sunrise. And it wasn't. It was typical Easter sunrise here in Norman Beach, gray. But something that was so cool on, on Sunday morning, on Friday morning, was it was so cold that the ocean was rising up. The, the steam was coming out of the water and, and going up. And it's just a reminder, and all of creation points us to God's love and God's grace, that there's always a rising up, even in the darkness. And, and we celebrate that on days like today. And so we're going to finish up this message series, uh, shifting kind of gears. Uh, you should have your brown bags, so good. Um, we started this message series talking about this is who we are. We were kind of looking at who we are at First United. Uh, we discover hope, we deepen faith, we demonstrate love. That Really what we're about here is we're trying to create places and spaces for people to connect with God and with each other. How do we do that? And, and we've been talking about that, but really the question is how do we do that? How are we creating these places and these spaces? What are the things that can help us uh, create a place and a space for people to connect with God and each other where they discover hope and they deepen faith and they demonstrate love? And that's what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to look at, at a story that's in the Bible. There's something special about this story. Uh, We'll tell you about that in a second because it's in all the Gospels. But we're going to look at it from the Gospel of John. It's a story, the feeding of the 5,000. It's in John chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. So here's the story. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, remember Philip's one of the disciples, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked him this only to test him, for he had already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than a half year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men uh, were there. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they all had had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had, had eaten. After that, the people saw the signs Jesus performed. They began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. All right, so this is the story, the feeding of the 5,000 is what we call it. Do you know that this story is the only story that makes it into all four Gospels? Besides the crucifixion and resurrection, this is the only story that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all make sure we know the story of the feeding of the 5,000. They also make sure we know the story of the cross and the resurrection. But, that, but that's the only two stories. So there's got to be something to this story. If all four Gospel writers are like, dude, we've got to put this in. And so they kind of all do it. They all tell it a little bit different. But, but if you think about it, the woman at the well doesn't make it into all four stories. The prodigal son doesn't make it into all four Gospels. The birth of Jesus doesn't make it into all four Gospels. Your favorite story may not make it into all four Gospels. So there's something about this story that is really, really important. And I just want to acknowledge that up front. And there is all kind of theological stuff going on in this story that we are going to totally ignore today. Because I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about all the theological nuance. I mean, we could spend some time talking about that uh, Jesus taking the bread. Did you notice he said, when was, when was this near? Does anybody remember? It was in the story. The Passover. Remember what else happened on the Passover? There's, there's a connection between Jesus taking the bread and breaking it and giving it out. There's a connection there. there there's a, we could talk about that. We could talk about how many baskets were left over. 
12. We can talk about the 12 baskets and the Messiah and the kingdom of Israel and the 12 tribes. We, we can talk about all that and what's going on with that. We can talk about how there's a connection between Caesar, who Caesar would give out bread. They called it bread and circus. Caesar would feed the crowds and say, see, I take care of you. I feed you. Maybe Jesus is doing a response saying, no, no, I take care of you. God feeds you. We, we can talk about that. You can make the connection that a Roman legion was about 5,000 men, and here we got five, all kind of stuff going on with that going on in this story too. Lots of stuff. You could talk about, they wanted to make Jesus king, and he just kind of disappeared again. There's a lot we could talk in this story that I get really jacked up about. But we're going to ignore all of that today. And we're going to talk about the hero of the story. Who's the hero of the story? It's an open book quiz today. <laughs> the hero of the story is... Now, I know it says little boy on the screen. Where does it say that in the Bible? It doesn't. It does say a boy. And, but we always, and when you, in your mind, what, I mean, how, how tall is he? Is he a little boy? Is he like five or six, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve? I mean, where, how, what kind of boy is he? It doesn't tell us. In my mind, it's always, he's a little boy. He's a little boy who packed his lunch. I mean, how many of y'all took a lunch to school? Raise your hand. I had a lot of lunch. I did not. I never took a lunch. I never took lunch to school because I grew up in a small southern town that had really good cafeteria workers. We we ate good at Williston Elementary. We had, they had green beans and collard greens on a regular basis. It, I ate well. Um, but when I was in seminary, every day I took this. I ate lots of ham sandwiches because I do not like tuna fish. But this little boy, he shows up, and, and, and he's got a brown bag of tuna fish sandwiches. I mean, I know it says five loaves of barley and two fish, but let's just call it what it was, tuna fish sandwiches. And he takes them, and he shows up. This little boy, I mean, how old was he? All we know is the scripture is real clear. He was not a man. He was a boy who had packed his lunch, and he gives what he has. And that, that's what makes him the hero of the story he gave out of what, what he had. See, Jesus is there. He's preaching. He's teaching. He's done all this stuff. And these crowds come to him. And it says 5,000 men. And so, because they just didn't count women back then. Don't be mad at me. Don't send emails to me about that. That's the way it was back then, all right? But if you figure out 5,000 men, by the time you had the women and the children and all that stuff, what, 10,000, 12,000? There are a lot of people there. And they all show up. And Jesus is, I, I just, my, my vision of this story is Jesus is just kind of like, uh-huh. They were not on the guest list. And he asked the question out loud. Now, John tells us he was doing it to test them. That's because John's reading back into the story. Maybe, but Jesus just goes, but how are we going to feed all these people? And Philip's like, there ain't no way we're going to feed all these people. I mean, it would take a half year's wages. How many of you willing to give a half year to feed this crowd right now? We'd eat good, wouldn't we? I mean, a half year's bill, but we can't do this. And Andrew shows up and goes, hey, I got, a, I got a boy who's got some fish and bread here. How did Andrew know that little boy had fish and bread? You ever thought about that? Where in the story did Jesus say, hey, anybody got any food out there? We need some help. Where in the story did Jesus say, hey, Andrew, some of y'all disciples, go out there and check out the crowd. Go, go, see, who, go see who brought something. There's no point in the story where Jesus or any of the disciples or anybody said, hey, we need something, pony up. It's just all of a sudden, Andrew goes, I got a little boy here. He's got, he's got some tuna fish sandwiches. He says we can have them. The only, the only thing I can figure out is maybe, because uh, Jesus, there are lots of passages where Jesus liked the little children to be close. Hey, by the way, where was his mom in all this? Or his dad? Is he just showing up on his own? Was he just one of those kids going, I'm skipping school today because Jesus is coming to town, right? Or maybe mom and dad had come with him and they're like, what is he doing? But Jesus, what, what if Jesus, remember he says, let the little children come to me. What if they had figured it out by that point and the little kid is just sitting up close enough and hears Jesus go, hey, how are we going to feed these people? Little kid's like, I got, I got some tuna fish, Right? Or, or maybe the little kid just saw like Jesus saw. Maybe the little kid just looked out and went, man, there are a bunch of hungry people here and we're going to feed them. And, and he gives out of what he has. And that's, what, that's why he's the hero of the story. 
She says, hey, take this. You, you, can. you know that little boy didn't have to do that. That little boy thought ahead. He was smart, or maybe his mama thought ahead. He was going out that day, and he said, wait, before I go out, before I go do anything, let me, let me get some bread, let me get some tuna fish, let me mix it all together, put it in a little bag. You, you know, ain't no little boy made it to school with a wonderful thing. It's all drugged through the mud. But it was his. It was his to do what he wanted to with. What's interesting is when he gave it to Jesus, Jesus takes it and multiplies it and feeds 5,000 or more because when we trust God with what we have we trust God with our talents and our gifts and our abilities God multiplies it and blesses it and gives it to others with what we give now that little boy did not know here Jesus here's my fish have fun he he didn't know that God was going to do all this stuff with it I don't think Philip and Andrew knew either I'm pretty sure Philip went really five bread six and some fish Good luck. But Jesus takes this, and and it's incredible. Because some scholars will tell you that what Jesus did is Jesus took the bread and goes, gives thanks. Ooh, do not put that near the fire. Gives bread, gives thanks over it, breaks it, and then just all of a sudden, it's like the never-ending pasta bowl at Olive Garden. (laughs) It just starts coming out, and they just keep giving it, which is phenomenal. Some scholars also say that maybe what happened is a little boy goes, hey, I got some fish and bread here. And Jesus said, all right, let's, and Jesus prays over the fish and bread and said, hey, this little boy's going to share what he has. And they begin to share. And Jesus said, all right, we're going to give out of this little boy. And somebody else in the crowd went, well, shoot. I got a roast beef sandwich. <laughs> and somebody else went, well, I went to hooligans and got some wings. And we went and sat with them. Right? And that all of a sudden, some people say that maybe, maybe the miracle was that Jesus got 5,000 men to share some of their food. I mean, seriously, y'all look Thursday at Thanksgiving. What, what male shares any food off of his plate? <laughs> That's a miracle. And however you look at it, whether Jesus just has the unending pasta bowl going out, or 5,000 men said, look, we'll share out of what we have. I, I don't care how you view this miracle. When we give out of what we have, people see God. When we're willing to take what we have and give, people see what God can do. You know, that's happened here at First United. Uh, We've seen it. Uh, With the hurricane response. You know, our our church has made a commitment, and we, we, our church, uh, through some folks in our church, we have given $500,000 to the Florida Annual Conference in a matching gift to tell the rest of the Methodist churches, pony up your cash uh, and meet us. That's a million dollars. Uh, that we're going to give to Alabama, West Florida, to rebuild in, in that area. Um, and as of a Friday afternoon, the conference said they had reached $406,000 uh, already. And I know several churches are doing a Christmas Eve offering uh, to go towards that. that. That's incredible to see what God's doing across the state. But also one of the things y'all did is remember uh, Pat DeWeese in our church said she had an RV and she was going to fill up that RV and take all the supplies up. And so a couple weeks ago, there were all kinds of supplies here. We loaded it up, and she took it up uh, to Panama City area. And she and I sat down this week and take a look at part of her story. Good morning, First United. I want to thank you all for all the donations that you allowed us to take down in my RV to Mexico Beach. Um, Everyone that we saw was so thankful for everything, and we we felt blessed through them. And we also saw God working in so many ways as we left on this trip. There were three of us that packed the RV up on Sunday, and as we were pulling out, I went back into church and asked for prayers, as we did not leave until Tuesday, but asked for prayers while people were gathered. And as I walked out of church, I was handed a $100 bill for gas. And it just so happens when we filled up the RV, it cost $96.98 for that tank of gas, which was such a blessing in disguise. God was there all the way. I had my 
shirt that I borrowed from Holly that said First United, and so every time someone asked who I was, I just said, well, I'm from First United. And we have this RV full of stuff that needs to go to Mexico Beach, and we also have the RV that we're delivering to Mexico Beach. And no one wanted our supplies dumped off there, so they kept letting us go. We got into Mexico Beach. Um, the first people we communicated with were a couple of that sat across from the, Mex um, the Methodist Church that had been water damaged and structurally damaged, but they said the um, beams that they helped build the church with and had prayed over were still standing. They said they stayed in their house that night um, and prayed all night long and prayed for the beams to hold up the church. And so their prayers were answered in that sense. The church is not habitable right now, but the beams are standing. Um, we went to City Hall. City Hall was still intact. Asked them about the lady that was wanting to rent my RV. They had no clue who that was. They had no knowledge, which made it seem more like a God thing that was sending us that way. Um, but they s told us to go to the First Baptist Church where all the supplies were being dropped off. Went there, left our supplies. The pastor, his wife, their son, they all prayed for us, even the guards that were um, guarding Verizon that was parked in their um, parking lot prayed for us and they also had the Billy Graham disaster relief team there in with their trailers and they prayed for us and helped that we would find our purpose so every place we went we felt the hand of God even though it wasn't making sense um, um, at the Baptist Church when we drove up they were thrilled to have our supplies uh, pastor his son pastor's wife everybody helped us unload um, that was the hub for all supplies of Mexico Beach and they were thrilled to have it they had the church was structurally damaged but it was still usable it had not had flood damage and so one room was filled with paper products another room with food products another room with cleaning supplies water was left outside um, medicines were protected so that they didn't just get in the wrong hands so they were very organized and they were such a blessing and they thanked us over and over and they also were looking to see if any of their parishioners might need a place to live and so i want to thank everyone from first united um, for praying for us and we just saw god in every step of the way thank you very much So Pat, raise your hand. Raise your hand, Pat. Pat, right there. Pat's down here on third, fourth row. Uh, she can tell you a lot more that happened on that trip. One of the things that we didn't put in the video, but I mean, she went up there trying to find this person to give the RV to. She just knew that's what God was calling her to do, but they could not find the person that wanted the RV. And that's where they kept checking and checking and checking. DCF, all this all kind of state, all kind of stuff, trying to find this person. Couldn't find it. Finally got to the point they had to come home. And this guy came to them and said, hey, long story short, we need some electrical work. And the guy that drove up the RV for her was an electrician. And he said, hey, I'll, I'll take you if you can come work for us. Come on. He goes, he goes, you have a place to stay? He goes, I have an RV. <laughs> you never know how when what you're going to give. God can take what you give and do incredible things with it. And at the time, as Pat will tell you, it didn't make any sense whatsoever. But she gave out of what she had. And y'all have seen God through it. And Mexico Beach has seen God through it. We do. Question for you today is this. What's in your brown bag? What are you willing to give? In your brown bag, there should be a slip of paper. Oh, this was planned, people. Uh, over the last several weeks, we've been kind of talking to you about what, what's your next step. What's the next thing for you on the journey of faith? We've been pushing you to kind of make a decision to grow in your faith in some way. And we, we've been talking about it, I believe, it's, it's still in your bulletin. Can I see the bulletin? Rebecca, here, I'll come to you. Because the pastor wasn't prepared enough with the bulletin. 
We talk about how we want you to discover hope, I mean, to commit your life, maybe join the church or be baptized or, or, or uh, make a reaffirmation of your baptism. We, we talked about, we want you to attend consistently. I mean, what, what's your plan? I mean, we talked at the beginning of the year. Are you going to do 26 times? You're going to do every other week. You're going to do 36 times, three times a month. You're going to do 40 times, which is 75% of the year. I mean, how many times are you going to show up and worship? Because what we do in worship matters. It's, how, it's what grows us and sustains us and pushes us on that. We, but we also realize it's more than just worship. It's, it's one of the things that uh, my wife and I were talking about yesterday on the way home uh, from Terry's house about being part of a group, being connected in some way. You are not alone. And there's power in this. We want you to be in a group, whether that's a growth group, a small group, a study group, a short-term group, uh, a service group, some capacity uh, of doing that. Because we want you to grow relationally. How are you connecting uh, with people on that? And we, uh, we have several ways to do that. I know in January we're going to have another big push uh, with the sermon series we're doing in January. Uh, and then again in March, we'll have some push to maybe thinking uh, about that or with the Habitat House. John tells me they're going to start painting in a couple of weeks. And yeah, I'm not showing up for that. Um, but some of y'all like to paint because uh, I cannot follow the details. <laughs> My ADDA. <laughs> but maybe join with, join with the Habitat some way in a group. Uh, we, we talk about you wanting you to give generously, putting God first. Uh, putting God first in your finances. You be intentional uh, in, in your giving uh, on that. Uh, are you going to give in, in a percentage? What, what's your percentage or your monthly gift? And we want to talk about that. And, and one of the things, I know some of, our, some of our church members get leery when I start talking about this. One, because don't, people don't like talking about money, but as, as you know, what you do with your money matters. It is a spiritual issue. That's where you put God first. But as I said Thursday night, if you're at the Poetry Night, First United is doing well financially this year. You've been, you've been faithful in your finances. And we actually, our giving's above budget this year, which has never happened in my recent memory. And also, our spending's below budget. Uh, so we, we're, we're, we're hoping to end the year with a surplus. And Rob's over there going, man, don't tell them that, don't tell them that, don't tell them that, right? <laughs> I, I, I'm comfortable in telling you all that because you give not, not because, okay, we've got to pay the bills. You give because it's a spiritual discipline. It's a habit. It's an understanding I'm going to put God first. But, but I want to let you know that if we can end the year with the, a surplus, we have money kind of making the turn into, into 2019. Uh, one of the things, we're, we're, we, we increased our budget for next year a little bit because we're starting to talk about expanding out west, uh, the Wild West. There's some freaky people out there in the Wild West. The Wild West is going to be different than First United because those are the people out west. They don't, they don't understand the beach and how beautiful it is. Right? Uh, well, I'm going to get the emails on that. You don't understand. I live in. Br- we love everybody out there. But, but what would it look like to do something out there? And, and, we, and we'd love to be able to take some money aside from the end of this year and put it into a fund perhaps to use to expand ministry out west. It's going to be completely different than the ministry. We're going to keep doing the ministries we do here and begin to expand. We're, we're beginning to talk about what would it look like to bring a staff member on next year way out west. Just to handle out west. Not to do stuff here. Because we have some good staff doing stuff here, but the good staff doing stuff here can't do stuff out there. What would that begin to look like? If we had some money, so just to ask you to be faithful. If you ever have questions about what are y'all doing with the money, uh, call Brett or Rob. They'll, they'll tell you straight up. But they're, they're phenomenal. Carol, hey, Carol, Carol. They're, they're phenomenal uh, with the money on knowing that kind of stuff. But one other thing I just want to throw out to you when you think about giving out of what you have, something that happened this year that you're not aware of. Um, many of y'all know Sid and Betty Lester in our church. Uh, they've been members of our church for years. Um, and and uh, Betty died shortly after I got here, 20, 2014, 2015. Sherry's kind of looking at me. 20, she died. And then, and then Sid moved out uh, to be with family in Houston, and he passed away this year. But, but Sid thought about the church long after he was alive because he, he, left, he left part of his estate to the church. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. Uh, and, and, and we got a, a donation uh, from Sid. So let me just tell you what we did with that from his family. Uh, one, our church is, is committed to a couple of principles. One of them is Financial Peace University. Uh, and we had a, uh, we had a debt. Uh, we have some, a, a loan on the property right there. Not the property out west, but the property on the end of the corner and the air conditioner and the roof. And we took some of that money to put down a large, uh, a, a significant amount of money against the principal of that loan. We thought it would be good to start paying down the loan. We also want to make sure our mission team that looks out for Osceola Elementary and New Start and Great Kids and some of the other ministries. So we put some money there because Sid and Betty were really passionate about some kids' stuff. But they were also passionate about Stephen's ministry and congregational care. And we were able to put some money into that. 
Uh, and we're hoping we can work with some other Methodist churches in the area and bring in some trainers. Uh, so we're not going to have to fly people out to be trained, but rather we can do it all here. It's really a cool thing. But somebody who thought, hey, I don't have, I don't have much, but I can give out of what I have. I don't know if you've ever uh, thought about that. We want you to serve passionately. We want you to fe- uh, share your faith fearlessly. That's when I really wish, hey, listen, Christmas is coming up. Next week's going to be a regular kind of standard week. And then the next week after that, we're starting a whole new series. Christmas, movies at Christmas, I think is what we're calling it. And so for our sermon series during Advent, we're going to look at some of the great Christmas movies of all time and where is God in those movies. What a Wonderful Life. True. I get everybody gets that. Christmas Story, because I definitely want the Red Ryder BB gun, baby. Right? Uh, Home Alone and Die Hard. No, no, just kidding. Die Hard's not a, <laughs> Die Hard's not a, <laughs> Die Hard's not a Christmas movie. But uh, several of us, we're going to be looking at that. Can I, and, and I will tell you, Christmas Eve, um, we're going to be talking about Scrooge, Christmas Carol, uh, a new start. It's a great opportunity to invite a friend to church. Uh, we want you to invite, we'd love for you to invite three friends to come and join you. Just three. And if you don't have three friends, you have a few weeks to work on it. Uh, and, make, and invite them to join with you in church in, in, in some way. On that. One other thing we're doing different today in your brown bag. If you'll take out it, get your card. Go ahead, pull it out. I should hear the rustling of brown bags. All right. Um, call me when you need. Call me when you need me card. Here's what I'd love for you to do on that. It, it, we need your name and your phone number and your email because that's, although we say call it also, it could be an email. Call me when you need some tuna fish sandwiches. Okay, or not. Um, actually, I don't know what you're good at. I don't know what you have the ability to do and serve in, but you do. You, you know, hey, call me when you need a violin player. Call me when you need a plumber. Call me when you need somebody to get a ride to the church. Call me when somebody needs a doctor's appointment visit. Call me when you need an electrician. Call me if you need somebody to help with financially. Call me if you need banana pudding. Although I have that list already. Um, call me... Call me when you need. Uh, like one of the things we've got going on is in a few weeks uh, with Halifax Urban Ministries and some dentists in our area, uh, we're going to do a dentistry for the homeless. Uh, let them, and, and we just need, we, we need we're going to use our bus and another church's bus, but we may need a couple other vans. And two of y'all say, hey, we'll, we'll drive people to their appointments. Call me if you need help driving to a, I don't know what you're good at, but you do. And here's what we're going to do with this list. I'm going to tell you straight up what we're going to do with this list. We're going to put it in the computer. The people that do that are going to put it in the computer. And then when we're sitting around the office going, hey, we need drivers for this event. We're going to pull up. Call me when you need. And we're going to say, hey, these people said they could drive. And then we're going to check your driving record. No, we're going to see. We're going to pull it up. Or call me when you need uh, assistance with this. And we're going to pull that up. And that, you know when we're going to call you? When you need. When we need it. Jesus didn't go out to that crowd going, hey, boy, give me, some, give, me, give me, I need your bread. He didn't tell his disciples, go out there and figure out the crowd and who's got what. He just simply said, hey, we got to feed this crowd. And people said, hey, this is what I can do. So here's what we would love for you to do. Fill that card out in the few, next few minutes here and put it back in your bag and just bring your bag up here and leave it. We'll take care of it from there. Because at the core of who our faith is, it's all about giving out of who we are. If you think about it, on the night in which Jesus gave himself, gave out of who he was, and took the bread and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. And when the supper was over, and he took a cup, And he gave thanks to God. And after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples. He said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. Poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you should drink of it in remembrance of me. And so today we come in remembrance of all that God has done for us. Come in remembrance of how God has gifted you. How God has given you the ability to. Maybe you're like that little boy and you have thought ahead and you have planned ahead and you have all these resources I can give them or 
Maybe you're, you're like me and you just say, hey, I, I don't have that, but I have this. And I'll give what I can. And just simply say, God, call me when you need. Because as Pat has shown us, when you are willing to give out of what you have, people see God. And that's how we create a place and a space for people to connect with each other and with God. Let's pray. God, we just ask that you pour out your spirit on us gathered here on these gifts of the bread and the cup and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. That as we feast on them, we might experience your love and your grace. And God, challenge us to be like that little boy who gave out of what he had. It didn't make sense. It doesn't always go the way we had hoped. But when we give out of what you have given us, you multiply it and people see you. We give you thanks for that privilege. But today as we come forward for communion, we need to see you. We need to know of your love and your grace. We need to be reminded we are not alone. That you are here with us. And that in the darkness, there is always light. And so pour out your spirit on us. That where there is sorrow, we might see hope. That where there is darkness, we might see light. That where there is chaos, we might see peace. May we always know love. We pray this prayer through Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.